In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this discussion, this chance to come to discuss the teachings of St. John Paul II in the theology of the body. Um, please send your Holy Spirit to be with us, enlighten our minds and our hearts to better understand, first of all, your word, Lord, your, your revelation and sacred scripture and how we are to understand this uh, with the help of great teachers like St. John Paul II. So we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for pray. us. John Paul II, pray, pray, pray for us. Okay. I will share my screen. So we are in chapter three, my favorite chapter, <laughs> although they're all great. Um, and hi, hey, Dennis, welcome. Um, and so we've been talking, we were, we were reflecting on Christ's words. So uh, this triptych of Christ's words when he appeals to the beginning, to the human heart in the Sermon on the Mount in our history, and now to the bodily resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, um, when Jesus is speaking to the Sadducees. Um, but now today, we are going to look at what St. Paul speaks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, so John Paul II will look at, first of all, Christ's words, what Jesus speaks about the resurrection. And Jesus actually talks to the Sadducees before his own Paschal mystery, before Jesus's own death and resurrection. Um, St. Paul, on the other hand, speaks about the resurrection after the fact that Jesus has risen. So Jesus, or St. Paul had his famous encounter with the risen Christ um, on his road to Damascus when he, we'll, we'll get into that. So, um, so these words of Christ had a singularly intense echo in St. Paul's teaching. So an intense echo of these same themes about the resurrection. So here's a story of St. Paul, as we know from the Acts of the Apostles, Saul or Paul of Tarsus, who after his conversion became apostle to the Gentiles, also had his own post-Paschal experience, analogous to that of the other apostles. So, so just as Jesus, after he rose from the dead for 40 days, he appeared to the apostles um, and spoke to them and taught them and showed them many things. Um, so in a very similar way to the apostles, St. Paul had this encounter with the risen Christ um, on his way to Damascus. At the basis of his faith in the resurrection, which he expresses above all in 1 Corinthians 15, certainly stands the encounter with the risen one that became the beginning and foundation of his apostolate. So really this encounter with the risen one is uh, the linchpin of our faith. Like St. Paul says, if Christ has not been risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So the fact that Christ rose is like the, the one of the central points of our faith. Um, so, in his pre-Paschal response, Paschal referring to his passion, death, and resurrection. Um, so in his pre-Paschal response, so this is when Jesus is talking to the Sadducees, Christ did not refer to his own resurrection. St. Paul will refer to Jesus' resurrection, but Christ, when he's speaking, he does not refer to his own resurrection, but appealed to the fundamental reality of the covenant of the Old Testament, to the reality of the living God, who is the basis of the conviction about the possibility of the resurrection. The living God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. In his post-Paschal argument about the future resurrection, Paul appeals above all to the reality and truth of Christ's resurrection. So when Jesus is speaking to the Sadducees, he appeals to them with the Old Testament. He appeals using the Old Testament revelation to speak to the Sadducees, in an argument that they would understand, in an argument that would win them over, hopefully, um, 
about God, who is the God of the living, and thus he has the power to raise the dead. He's the God of the living. Um, Jesus tells the Sadducees, you are wrong because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. So here he's, he's referring to the power of God. But when Paul speaks about the resurrection, he, he talks about Jesus's resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and also your faith is in vain. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. St. Paul. The resurrection is also the answer given by the God of life to the historical inevitability, inevitability of death to which man was subjected after breaking the first covenant and which entered his history together with sin. So um, sin and death have been a part of our history since the fall, since the original sin of Adam and Eve. And God's answer, God, the God of life, his answer to this dilemma that every human undergoes death is the resurrection. So this is God's answer uh, to the fact that we have death in life. Um, he, Jesus rises from the dead. In this context, one finds words that can be considered a synthesis of Pauline anthropology concerning the resurrection. So in the theology of the body, we've been doing an anthropology, a study of the human person in the light of revelation, in the light of sacred scripture, especially Christ's words. Here we're looking at St. Paul's anthropology of the resurrection. Texas is finally starting to thaw out from the... Here are the words of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised full of power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written that the first man, Adam, became a life, life became a living being. But the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. Okay, so now when, when St. Paul, so when St. Paul, or it is significant for the Pauline text that the eschatological perspective on man based on faith in the resurrection of the body is united with the reverence, reference to the beginning as well as the deep consciousness of man's historical situation. So when St. Paul speaks about the resurrection, he ties it to the beginning. Um, he talks about the first Adam, the first Adam in the beginning. Um, and it's also tied to man's historical situation, the fact that we are fallen, that we're slaves of corruption. He, he speaks of this state of historical man. Um, at the same time, appealing to the resurrection. So he ties these three threads together, these three pillars of the theology, but the beginning, the history, and the eschaton. Um, Paul, Paul ties all those together. Um, and he'll do the same thing in the letter to the Ephesians. He'll speak about the beginning. He refers to the beginning in there as well, as we'll see later. Um, in his synthesis, so John Paul II calls this a Pauline synth synthesis, Paul thus reproduces everything Christ had proclaimed when he appealed at three different moments to the beginning in the dialogue with the Pharisees, to the human heart as a place of struggle with concupiscent desires in man in the Sermon on the Mount, and to the resurrection as the reality of the other world in the dialogue with the Sadducees. Okay, and then um, he goes on to speak about uh, the letter to the Romans, um, St. Paul, St. Paul to the Romans, um, when he speaks about uh, all of creation that groans and suffers labor pains until now. Um, he said, St. Paul says, uh, 
the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God and cherishes the hope that it itself will be set free from the slavery of corruption to enter into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So uh, St. John Paul II comments on this, that sin, it doesn't only hurt ourselves, you know, it does damage ourselves, our relationship with God, it damages our relationship with one another, but it also has a cosmic dimension that it that is connected to all of creation as well, that man's sin, we're connected, we're all connected. So um, there's a cosmic dimension to our sin, and somehow all of creation is groaning and under waiting the free, the revelation of the sons of God. So somehow creation is suffering the consequences as well of this original sin, and, and creation is also awaiting this redemption. Um, if in this image of the body of historical man, which is so realistic and adequate to the universal experience of human beings, conceals within itself, according to Paul, not only the slavery to corruption, but also hope, similar to the hope that accompanies labor pains. The reason that the apostle captures in this image also the presence of the mystery of redemption. So while, while um, human beings are, and all of creation is, has a slavery to corruption, um, we, there's still hope of creation that is a hope that's similar to labor pains. So yes, while all creation is groaning, as in labor pains, labor pains bring about new life. Labor, labor pains bring about new birth. So there's hope in this. Um, and it, we have this hope because of St. Paul has in mind the mystery of redemption that Jesus accomplished. Redemption is at work in man's soul through the gifts of the Spirit. So I just like how John Paul II ties in the Holy Spirit again, that this sanctification, this life of holiness, life of grace is through the Holy Spirit um, that enables us to love, that enables and give, empowers us, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit working through us is, is what causes the redemption to happen. Redemption is the way to the resurrection. The resurrection constitutes the definitive accomplishment of the redemption of the body. So when we're redeemed, when Jesus redeems us, the goal of this, the ultimate fulfillment of this redemption is the resurrection. Um, so this is ultimately where we're headed. So a couple of announcements. Our, we're doing the book study for Letter to Families on Wednesdays. We have our last one this coming Wednesday. And then next week, the first week of March, we'll start the Love and Responsibility book discussion uh, for 12 weeks. So there's two times we're doing that on Monday and on Wednesday. So if you want to join, please uh, contact me and you can sign up. Nick, what are the times? Um, Monday. Um, Monday at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and Wednesday from 5 to 6 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Um, this coming weekend, we're going to Conception for just an introduction to the theology of the body, an overview course of the entire uh, theology of the body. Then at the end of March, there is a weekend retreat at the LaSalle Retreat Center in St. Louis to cover uh, specifically chapter one of Theology of the Body when Christ appeals to the beginning. Yes. Okay. So what, were, what are your thoughts or reactions, um, questions, insights from this audience? Which 70? This was a long audience. <laughs> yeah. It was. And I actually look at it and wonder why he put it all together. Because to me, it seems 
like he starts getting onto a separate topic when he starts talking about the redemption of all of creation. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder like how he chose, because I, I'm assuming that he wrote it all, um, you know, in Poland before he became Pope. And, and then he, when he became Pope in 1978, he started delivering this in 1979. So I guess he had to split it up, you know? So I wonder like how he chose where to break, I guess just what would seem like a, an appropriate length for a, a Wednesday audience. Well, I have a question that is kind of a tangent and kind of refers back to things that we've spoken about earlier in part three about um, the resurrection or eschatological man. John Paul II brought up that um, in heaven with our redeemed bodies, we will experience like the fullness of God's truth and love in our bodies. And that got me wondering, do you guys think that we can experience God's truth in some way in our bodies now? Um, something that's kind of like a, a stepping stone to get us excited and to help us relate to the future resurrection of our bodies? Amos, I think that that would uh, depend on the depth of our prayer and, and, and spiritual life. And that's what the, you know, the three stages that are traditionally presented in the spiritual life, what the unitive stage would be. And I think if we're trying to see a probably an ex, well, I don't like the word extreme, but I can't think of another one right now. Example, it'd be uh, St. Teresa of Avila in that experience that's captured in that uh, work of art where she's pierced. Yeah, the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Exactly. Yes, thank you. And Amos, you make me think of the experience of silence. Maybe not in a way so, so strong as St. Teresa of Avila experienced, but when we allow ourselves to be in silence and in the presence of God, I think we can experience even in our bodies, like this fullness. If we just take, you know, like deep breaths and, and stay silent. I, right now I'm connecting weekly to a silent prayer with a few friends. And it's funny because we connect through Zoom, but we just stay in silence for 20 minutes. <laughs> but the thing is being together in silence in the presence of God. And there's this strong feeling of togetherness and of being in the presence of God. And I think that's sort of what, what you're asking, you know, feeling it even in our bodies, this, this fullness. And maybe it has to do with, I like this term, Nick, that the Pope uses in this, audition in this what's the name i forgot in this uh, audience in this audience yes sorry thank you the word he uses about the cosmic dimension i think it's amazing because i sometimes use this term when i explain and uh, when we start the workshop the theology of the body workshop about the um, theology of creation and they always follow this idea because i i tell I, I tell them that we can see God in, in creation, in many things, in the universe, in the, in the sunset, in, in the ocean. And, and they always connect with this idea of, you know, this, and it's like a cosmic idea of seeing God in, in creation. And then I give this step where I explain to them that we can also sense or see God in our bodies, in our female or in our male bodies. And, and this idea about the cosmic dimension and how our sin affects everyone. And, and it also affects creation. And also we can put it in a balance and, and think that our good deeds, I once met a priest who said our good deeds 
have like this sound that resonates through all eternity. And I thought it was a beautiful idea. And I, that would be like the contraposition to this scene being cosmic. Also our love, our prayer, our good deeds have this resonance through all eternity. Nick Grant, I think you have your, your mute, yeah. Uh, Amos, great question. And, and as I was thinking what you were saying, the, the challenge is as historical man after the fall, with concupiscence all around us, how do, how do we come as close as possible to either the beginning or the other world that will come? And really, I think what John Paul is saying is it, it has to do with the heart. And I think the church gives us ways because I can't think of a better way if the heart is right than communion, the Eucharist, to bring us into that almost the other world. I can understand Amos's uh, question about why all of a sudden the cosmic was introduced, but I think it's it's important to understand the cosmic aspect of it from the point of view of too often people think of salvation or redemption as very individualistic. And this is taking the fact that uh, God's plan started with a creation of which man was a part of and it'll be redeemed in a new heavens and new earth that uh, man will be a part of if he uh, mm -hmm. remains faithful. Yeah, I love that too. It's like, um, like, somehow when we're speaking about redemption when we're speaking about you know the end the resurrection then somehow is tied back to the beginning of like god creating the world and um i think i was trying to see like notice how after he almost said that like how john paul ii transitions from <laughs> where he just was to speaking about um, Romans so he I think he so he was speaking about how Saint Paul ties all these three aspects together the beginning the history and the resurrection and then in uh, paragraph number seven um, he says it belongs to the style of Paul's synth synthesis that it plunges its roots deeply into the revealed mystery of creation and redemption um so he seems to be going to the roots of St. Paul, which is back to the mystery of creation. Um, and he says like about that, about that beginning, St. Paul speaks about the first Adam and that he became a living being. This is referring to um, the second chapter of Genesis where God breathed into Adam um, his breath and he became a living being um, yeah and so even there in the first chapters of Genesis there's this relation between soul and body of the human person you know of the soul and body and then we saw John Paul II speak about this relationship of soul and body in the resurrection um, the spiritualization of the body where this new, the body will be completely submitted to the, the powers of the spirit. Um, but while on earth, we have this tension between soul and body um, that St. Paul speaks about. And then uh, what Paul calls the slavery of corruption. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just trying to see how he transitions from 
one point to the other. Point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As I, I look at it, like Nick, that is a really good um, overview of like the points he's making along the way. Um, I look at it and wonder why he didn't end his audience after paragraph six. And maybe it's because seven and eight would be too short for another audience in themselves. Um, and he didn't want to split up audience 71 at all. Um, but there's a whole lot of really great things here in paragraph six and, excuse me, in paragraph seven and eight. Um, the first one that strikes me is that John Paul II was kind of known for emanating hope. Um, he was a sign of hope for the whole world. I have a um, Marvel Comics, Pope John Paul II comic book that was written in like 1981 uh, before he got assassinated or before there was the assassination attempt taken on his life. Um, and it just talks about how he's the symbol of hope for the world that um, everybody, you know, from like uh, lewd construction workers to rambunctious teenagers, like they're just attracted to him because he resonates he radiates hope. Um, and it's something that even people who wouldn't call themselves religious caught on to that there's something about like just that man's personality that they, they were drawn to. Um, and so it's great to find here that um, in paragraph eight, um, Paul's description about the resurrection of the body um, being a freedom, a release from the slavery of corruption um, is a sign of hope and that when we struggle in life, we're, we're kind of like going through the labor pains of God's redemption being formed in us. And so I know that there's a lot of things that I've struggled with, um, even now during this coronavirus period of isolation, um, I, I'm finding new things to struggle with. And so it's great to think that even that is the seed of hope planted in my soul. Um, that is part of God's plan for redemption. And one of the other big themes in John Paul's writings all over the place, he's always focused on redemption. Um, you know, St. Joseph is the guardian of the Redeemer. Um, the church's mission is the mission of the Redeemer. Um, and George Weigel said that John Paul II always had redemption in the forefront of his sight. He was always looking at it in everything he did. And I think that's great for great advice for us, for how we can grow in that virtue of hope, to try to look for the way that God's redemption is being worked out in our lives and in the world. And the third thing that I really like here is that, as you mentioned, he ties in the gifts of the spirit as a sign of that redemption. And when he talks about the gifts of the spirit in paragraph eight, I don't think he's talking necessarily only about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, but I think he's saying that all of the effects of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, um, those are also signs of redemption. And so it's great to think that as we're looking for something to stir up our Christian hope, the theological virtue of hope, it's great to know that there's a redemption taking place throughout the universe, through our struggles, but most importantly, through the way that the Holy Spirit is working in us. Um, and the more that we're attentive to that, the more we're able to be thankful and grow in hope. So I think those three points are just brilliant here in the last couple of paragraphs. Thank you.
Thank you, Imaz. It's so much content. Thanks for sharing. I, I will keep this in mind. There is redemption taking place through the Holy Spirit working in us. It, it gives us hope and it, it motivates us to keep on praying and, and trying to grow, but also confidence that the, the Holy Spirit is doing, is working and we need to trust him. What about this uh, tying the redemption to the resurrection? Like, have you ever, like, I, I love how he, John Paul II, says the redemption is the way to the resurrection. So it's like this redeeming that Amos was talking about that we can see in our world even. Like, I, lo I love how he said that Amos, like, John Paul II was, had redemption in his, in his eyesight. Like, that's how he was looking for that, looking for the redemption that's taking place in the world. Um, but it's nice to see that that redemption is leading towards the resurrection. Um, yeah. You know, for me, that's a new concept because I usually think that Christ's death and resurrection leads to our redemption, that it was started by him, then it gets applied to us as we, you know, are justified initially at baptism as we grow in holiness throughout our lives. Um, but it's great to realize that, like, there's another sense, the redemption of our bodies that will take place at the um, end of this age, that there's a resurrection that all this redemption is leading towards. So it's nice to think of uh, Christ's resurrection, our resurrection as um, maybe two bookends or at least two highlights in the story of our redemption. Yeah, it's like it's like Christ's resurrection enabled our redemption that leads to our resurrection, right? <laughs> so it's like resurrection of Christ le leads to our resurrection through the redemption. Yeah. And this is dumb, but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, I like graphs and charts. <laughs> and so I imagine that if you... Um, charted out like our redemption um, it would start with Adam and Eve where there are our um, forefather and foremother um, the father and mother of the whole human race so redemption was going really well until they disobeyed God and ate from the fruit of the tree and then it's like all of a sudden our chart goes down to zero and we stay at zero um, throughout the Old Testament as hints of our redemption come along. Um, but then when Christ appears, and especially at his um, passion and death and resurrection, then like our redemption kind of starts. And it's going to go up until we get to um, the end of this age. And then it's going to be maxed out for all eternity, um, assuming that we're faithful to him and uh, remain in a state of grace. I like that visual. I like, I like thinking of it in that way, like as a graph, like, okay, in the beginning, we started out really well. We're on a great relationship with God and then we plummet. And then in the old Testament, there's some like bumps, <laughs> um, you know, God reaching out and God, like, you know, in the old Testament and the people of Israel going up and down and yeah. And then, yeah, Christ, I love, I love that. Yeah. And, you know, Nick, maybe it works better as like an EKG, like the heartbeat on a hospital monitor. 
So when Christ comes, it's like, boom, right? There, right. right. <laughs> He does give us a new heart and a new soul, so that kind of works, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and th there is also this phrase that you mentioned, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Such, also such a beautiful idea and something we look forward to. And it, it reminded me, last night I, I saw a movie with my husband, maybe some of you have seen it. Um, the name is Clouds. It's based on a song with that name. We, we watched it on the Disney, whatever, Disney. Like, like Prime, but Disney. Disney Plus. Uh, yes, probably. It's because Pi has a password and she can watch this Disney thing. <laughs> but it's it's based on a real story and you can look for it because the, the song Clouds was composed by an 18-year-old boy who was dying of cancer and it became a very, very popular song. And it's mostly about hope because he's he knows he's going up, up to the clouds where the view where the view is much prettier and where his lighter. I don't remember the lyrics, it's beautiful, but through the movie, I thought about the pain the parents were experiencing. And it was hard to imagine how could they handle so much pain. And there's some glimpses through their faith. And you can tell they're Catholics because they, they bring the boy to Lourdes, Lourdes, we call it. So he can submerge in the water. And th there are these like short ideas where you can see that their faith is, is sustaining them. But when I read this, and when you were talking about it, Amos, the freedom of the glory of the children of God, it reminded me of those parents and the anguish I felt thinking about them, uh, you know, accompanying their son on his way to death. And I think only having this, this confidence and, and being sure of this, Bernadette and Sarah, so now I have the girls with me. <laughs> I was the only girl, but now they're here. No, but you know, and the ones who are parents maybe can can understand my anguish. Seeing these parents going through all this pain, and I think this is the only way to to face something like this. I don't know if if they didn't have faith, how could they face their son's death? And thinking about these, that, that he's going to find this freedom the, of the glory of the children of God and his body will be redeemed and resurrected and, and beautiful and see God face to face. And I think that's the only thing that can sustain us as parents or as a sick person or as a friend of someone who's sick or whoever. I was telling them about a movie, Bernadette. The name is Clouds. It's beautiful. It will make you think of heaven. <laughs> What can you repeat the name again? Clouds, like clouds in the sky. Oh, clouds. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh -huh. It's it's a Disney production. It's not, but it's a, a real story. I want to read more about the real story because it was very, you know, it made me think of heaven again. And we had been right. talking about heaven and mm -hmm. all these eschatological realities. So it was very right, right on spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, that sounds like a really cool movie. I'll have to check it out. Um, but but something you brought up um, made me remember a book that I read in college, in a like um, overview of religions class. Um, it was a book about a man who was grieving the death of his son, and the man was a Christian. And I think it was early on in the grieving process because, um, because you know, early on, like all sorts of thoughts go through your mind and it's sometimes you can't even control your emotions and 
what you're thinking and you know you're not thinking clearly but you can't do anything to change that um and this man said that he knew he believed in the resurrection of the body and knew that one day he would see his son again but that just made it harder at the time to realize that he couldn't have like complete closure on the situation um and I have thought about that many times about what truth there is in that and what untruth there is in that statement. Um, and, and I wonder, um, especially for those on this call who are parents, um, if that statement makes any sense that the resurrection in some way would make it harder to lose a child or even um, a loved one of any sort knowing that you were separated from them for a, a period of time, but it, it wasn't final. I don't know, probably the answer to that is something that Nick Grant mentioned before, because he talked about Holy Communion. And I don't know, maybe this father was thinking about, he, he was gonna be missing he sounds so much knowing that he's alive somewhere and that he can't be with him. But if we think about what Nick mentioned about Holy Communion, and if we understand what the, the community of saints is, then we get this relief of knowing when we, when we receive Holy Communion, we know that we are with the person. Yeah. We, yeah. we really and truly are. And it also reminds me, I know a woman who, whose son died of cancer. She's very close to my sister-in-law. And she used to tell my sister-in-law that she would tell her son when he was about to die that he could come and visit her in her dreams and that they would play and that they would be together. And I remember listening to that and thinking, oh, if she knew that receiving the Holy Communion, she's gonna really be with him. She could explain it to him, not in dreams, but really and truly together. So I don't know, does that make sense? And since Nick Grant talked about Holy Communion, I think that's something very important that we have. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm not sure if the author of the book was Catholic. I just know that he was Christian in um, some tradition. And so it could very well have been that he didn't have, he was a non-Catholic and didn't have a strong sense of the communion of the saints. and didn't believe the same thing about Holy Communion that the Catholic Church has always taught. But you're right, Delia and Nick, that, that is a great point for um, Catholics who face such a, a difficult situation as losing a child or losing someone very close unexpectedly. I wonder too if the stages of grief plays a part in that too. Yeah, yeah. Because the immediate loss has to be immense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Ed, I think you're really on to something there. Um, I know that I loved C.S. Lewis's um, writing on a grief observed, where he talks about all these thoughts going through his head, and he's very open and honest and vulnerable about the pain. And he, he talks about how at one point he he wonders if there's a God, and then a couple of days later, or maybe a, a couple of weeks later, he's convinced there is a God, but God must be a cosmic tyrant to allow something so horrible to happen. And then a couple of weeks later, he's at the point where, no, God is still good, but God is just mysterious, and I wish he didn't cause me this pain. And then by the end of the book, um, he's in a much more stable place where he realizes that like the, even the pain has a purpose. The book of Job comes to mind as you were mentioning all that. We just uh, recently read through that in um, the Bible in a Year podcast and it's now fresh in our minds. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's kind of like a similar stage that you mentioned with C.S. Lewis I were um, he didn't go through it but his friends kind of went through it his wife you know telling him to 
deny God and just die and whatnot. And, and at the end he didn't and he prospered, but um, yeah, it's just, I can uh, imagine, I guess, as a, as a Catholic, um, knowing about everything I've been reading, you know, in this in here and um, the, in the spousal meaning of the body, when, when someone, I, I just imagine like one of my children dying, God forbid, um, and that grief, you know, we have that spousal meaning, so we are in that communion. And um, as soon as the, the person is gone, that it's almost like that communion is, is broken, so to speak, immediate. So that, that's very hard. I mean, it's just, you know, the thought just brings, you know, sadness, immediate just sadness to my heart. But knowing that we have that communion of saints that we're still in that communion and that we look forward to that, you know, that, that communion of saints that, that will hopefully, you know, <laughs> give me that um joy to look forward to yeah so i don't know when uh, my father passed uh the priest spoke of the the thin veil that separates us and uh, mm -hmm. i try to keep that in mind that uh you know um, which I, I think is is just a, another way of expressing uh, how we are still in the communion with the communion of saints, but uh, the uh, we don't have the feeling of immediacy and, and same presence that we had. But as uh, Dahlia pointed out, you know how much I. Uh, often dwell at communion time of how this is a time that I'm sharing of praising God uh, with my father and my mother and those who have passed and I'm, that are dear to me. And that's why I, I kind of enjoy listening to the communion, I mean, to the uh, Eucharistic prayer because it always includes some sort of reference to the communion of saints and how it's prayed. Yeah. And I always remind people that if they lose a, uh, a close person, they always uh, have the chance of having an intercessor up there for them in heaven. Well, any, anything else from this audience you want to talk about? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful how our, our faith, our Catholic faith includes um, so much hope in it, you know, like uh, hope of the resurrection of the body. And, um, you know, I think scripture talks about the fear of death, like that has, you know, plagued people, I guess. Um, but with the resurrection, that fear is kind of taken away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine like an atheist or something like how, how, uh, yeah, when, when people die and when they're suffering, like, I don't know how someone would handle it. Um, yeah. I mean, I know, I know someone who says like, they, they think, you know, faith, they, oh, that just makes you feel better. You know, that, that's just, you just do that to feel better. Um, but I guess I would argue like that 
we're basing our faith on a, a historical event, um, you know, of Christ, his resurrection that actually happened um, in his teaching, <laughs> the one who did rise from the dead, what he said about what will happen. Um, so. Any other any other thoughts on the, these topics? Well, I look forward to uh, continuing our discussion of Saint Paul and really what what Saint Paul is adding to. Um, this discussion on the resurrection as we've seen, we've looked at first Corinthians 15 and we've, we've seen some of Romans. So I'm excited to see what happens next. Um, so let's go ahead and end in prayer. Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for the gift of this time together, the gift of the technology that enables us to connect from different parts of the world. Um, and to talk about these truths of our human condition as you've created us um, and, and as we live in our historical state and also where you're calling us uh, in the future. So, we, Lord, we just ask for the grace of um, nourishing our relationship with you most of all in our lives and with one another. So we pray glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um,